Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And the sponsor of today's video, Spotlight Bullion, is giving away a roll of American Silver Eagles. Here's how to win. With gold prices hitting all-time highs and silver premiums through the roof, you need someone who's going to find you the best deal when buying and selling physical gold and silver. That's where Spotlight Bullion comes in. They compare prices of bullion products across all the major dealers to save you time and money finding the lowest premium. Plus, you can track prices and get notifications when they reach a threshold you set. With a catalog of over 1,000 products, you can be sure they have what you're looking for. Now, use the link in the description to create an account at Spotlight Bullion for a chance to win a roll of American Silver Eagles. Winners will be announced May 31st. Restrictions may apply, and this contest is only open to residents of the United States. And today's guest is a professional investor and economist with over 30 years of experience and the president and founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies. We're going to get his thoughts on commodities, precious metals, and how investors can wrap their head around the current market environment. It's Michael Pento. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me on, Jesse, and thanks for having a non-commodity expert on the program. I hope I could be of some benefit to you and your audience. Excellent. Well, I want to start off with a comment you made in a recent interview you did with Liberty and Finance where you said, when reality hits this market, which you think could be March or April this year, it's going to be ugly and brutal, and the Fed probably can't do anything about it. So break that down for us. Well, that's That's a depressing thought, isn't it? Well, I look at uh, the second derivative of growth and inflation when I make my determination as to where I want to invest. And I also look at the liquidity impulse and the changes in in, in those dynamics. So come March 11th, the bank term funding program is going to expire. I I mean, I can't believe this is actually going to happen, Jesse. But, But this was the program that bailed out the entire U.S. financial system on March of 2023. Remember, we had these, these four banks go under back then. And the banks had assets that were really a problem. They were mostly treasuries and, and mortgage-related debt, mortgage-backed security, CMBS. And they handed them off to the Fed at full value. Uh, and, and even though they were like 60, 70 cents on the dollar, and the Fed gave them Fed credit, 100%, 100 cents on the dollar, and told them to go out and you know make loans and, and buy more bonds and whatever. And uh, that kind of floated the, the the whole banking system up for the greater portion of uh, like a year and a half. So um, I'm I'm sorry, a year. And and I think that um, once the bank has to take back their assets at the current value, market value, and then hand the Fed a hundred cents on the dollar. With interest, uh, hundreds of billions, you know, there's over $100 billion has to happen. Uh, you know, these banks aren't better off now than they were on March 11th of 2023. They're worse. That's a big negative liquidity impulse. Impulse. Bank, now, in addition, here's another negative Im- impulse that's ongoing. Banks are tightening lending standards. They That's already been, in the, been the case for over a year, about a year and a half to be exact. Now the regulators are raiding, uh, are raising capital requirements while their assets are eroding even further. So that's two negative impulses coming March and, and April. Um, around that time, around the end of March, sort of sometime in April, it's, it's just a, a, a guess on the trajectory, the, the vector of the decline in the reverse repo facility, that goes to zero or thereabouts in that time frame. Now, the re- reverse repo facility is the bank's excess liquidity that they were parking at the Fed out of the out of the whole US financial system, just laying fallow at the Fed, earning interest. 
And reserves are part of the high powered money. They're, it's, it's part of the monetary base. It's, it's Fed credit plus physical coins and currency. Are, that, that, that's the building blocks of all money supply. It's just a laying there foul at the Fed. That's coming out. It's been coming out from two and a half trillion to about a half a billion dollars now. Coming out and flooding the market with liquidity, bond market, stock market, everything. Well, that runs dry the end, you know, the end of March, early April. And, the, and, and it's at that time, here's the fourth negative liquidity impulse. It's at that time that quantitative tightening will really begin to bite. And we know our lessons of quantitative tightening. This will be the fastest pace of quantitative tightening, 90, 90 billion, 95 billion per month. That's what it's supposed to be. Um, that's a really going to put a lot of pressure on the banking system. So that's when I think this whole liquidity uh, impulse that was 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 turned from extremely negative positive to, to a positive in March of last year abruptly shuts off. So that's what I'm looking at. So what do you think the Fed and the powers that be, what do you think their reaction is going to be? Is it going to be to start aggressively cutting rates? They're obviously going to be between a rock and a hard place at that point. Well, that's, that's, that's the most salient question you could ask, Jesse. Um, since 1987, the Pavlovian response has been to every disaster, every hiccup in the stock market, every little pimple that's on the um, economic agenda is, well, let's just cut rates. Let's just flood the banking system with money, which is a wonderful idea when you have deflation. What's the, what's, what's the harm? And, and, I, and again, I don't believe we had deflation. The Fed thinks we had a problem with not hitting their goal on inflation. I, think it's, I would think it would be wonderful if we had 0% inflation or stable prices, which is the Fed's mandate. But they don't want that. They want at least a condition of 2% inflation. Well, their 2% inflation became 20% inflation because they have they have no idea what causes inflation. They don't know how to measure it. So how the hell can they get it right? So um, uh, the Fed's going to have a hard time increasing the money supply, lowering interest rates, and going back into QE when inflation is 50% above their target. I, I think they'll, they've already significantly destroyed the confidence UN, U.S. investors have, and even global investors have, in the purchasing power of our currency and in the and in the sanctity of our sovereign debt market. Going into a regime of ZERP and QE now would be disastrous for inflation. And I don't think they can do that with alacrity. Well, let's discuss the broad market here and the handful of tech stocks that are holding it up. You know, from my perspective, it looks like a classic Ben Graham case of overvaluation of a mania in the market. Um, first of all, what do you think is driving this? Is this retail investors? Is this fund managers that have to beat their benchmarks? Um, what what exactly is driving this investment in the Magnificent Seven? Uh, I've had a couple people on the show actually also push back against the idea that the market's in a bubble and that have basically said these stocks aren't overvalued and uh, the American economy is very strong. And um, they, I, 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 I've had these thoughts uh, on, on the show before from some guests. So I'm wondering what your take is on the whole situation. Well, the American economy is, a, is an artificial edifice and it's a disaster. It's predicated on the, the highest debt to GDP, highest debt to GDP ratio we have ever seen, including that time during World War II, previous peak. It's 125% of, of, GD, of GDP, debt to GDP. This is an absolute disaster. So the idea the American economy is strong is absolutely ridiculous. I, I, take, I take complete umbrage at that statement. Has no, it has no bearing uh, in reality. So let's just start there. Now let's just go back to your question. Um, so NVIDIA is trading. NVIDIA is, uh, when you look at the Magnificent Seven, and Microsoft, Amazon, Google, uh, Apple, Meta. When you look at these, there's seven stocks that are called the Magnificent Seven. They comprise 30% of the entire S&P 500. And whenever you have a very small handful of stocks concentrated that represent such a high percentage of the entire S&P 500, uh, you have ended in disaster. I mean, you're talking about 1929, the year 2000, Look at the nifty 50. It's just a disaster. But so people say, well, well, NVIDIA is a real company and 
it's not like it was, you know, like Cisco was in the internet. Well, I, I just, I disagree with that. So let's just look at a quick comparison. So Nvidia is trading at forty times sales and a hundred times earnings per share. So Cisco back in the year two thousand was trading at hundred and ninety times earnings per share, March of two thousand peak. So you could say, you could say to me, well, it's well, Cisco was more overvalued. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. 190 is, is more than 100. But even if you're trading at 100 times earnings, that means it will take 100 years at the current earnings rate, 100 years to capitalize your investment on a, from an earnings per share standpoint. 100 years. Now, I know that the growth rate is there. And I, and I am firmly a believer in artificial intelligence. I'm not one sitting here denying that it's going to be revolutionary. But can you tell me that Cisco was um a company that was going to go away in the year 2002 after the internet bubble burst and that the internet was is was um phony technology no but cisco still went down 83 percent. all the tech stocks went down 83 percent from 2000 march of 2000 to the summer of 2002 so here's what i'm saying it's a very concentrated market it's very dangerous and these these seven magnificent stocks that we just went over uh, are real companies. They're in a better position, less overvalued than they were in the year 2000. So maybe they just go down 30% or 50% instead of 83%. But is that something you want to suffer? It, uh, listen, uh, if we are in the wrong sector. I, I have a, a model called the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle model. And it, 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 there's five sectors in an economy measuring the, sec, the second derivative of growth and inflation. And it, it ranges from deflation and recession and depression all the way to hyperinflation and stagflation. And you're you're just in the you're heading into the wrong sector where you want to be overweight tech stocks. So re recession. And deflation, disinflation, which is, I think is the next sector that we're headed into, is not where you want to overweight tech stocks. You could lose, you know, 80%, maybe this time you feel better. You only lose 50%. Okay, congratulations. And where do commodities play a role in your model? I know you have a very specific way of investing and different timeframes call for different asset classes. Um, I do want to dive into that a little bit deeper um, a little bit later. Do you think now commodities are a good place to be? And if not, uh, when do you think would be a good time to be positioned in the commodity sector? So I'm cautious on mining stocks right now. Uh, I only have a very small stake in uh, gold miners. Uh, miners are are much uh, much better run companies, but they're still stocks. <laughs> mining stock, gold mining stocks, aren't gold, and they are stocks. So when the stock market is in trouble, these miners tend to get killed. If you look back in in two thousand and eight, um, the the miners topped out in the sp late spring, uh, you know, in the spring of two thousand and eight, and and then in, by the time July and August came, the liquidity crisis became particularly salient. And these miners got wiped out, wiped out because the whole stock market got wiped out. Then they bottomed earlier. They bottomed earlier in the stock market because you want to own miners when the liquidity is pouring into the system. And and we just talked about this. The, the response to, and I think, yes, I I do think we could be, Headed for another 2008 in scenario. It could even be worse in 2008 because yes, we have we have massive bubbles out there. We have the bubbles in real estate. We had the bubbles in uh, fixed income. We have an unprecedented bubble in the stock market. So it could be worse in 2008. But in 2008, the Fed, with uh, you know, within a year, Bernanke lowered the Fed funds rate from five and a quarter to zero. It didn't even blink. Uh, will Powell be able to do that this time? I just don't I just don't see it happening that quickly because we know where this road ends. I mean, you you could have a stagflationary quagmire in this country like we've never seen before. And that's when you want to own commodities. Let's just suppose let's just suppose Powell is and I and this there's a good case because the the, the Fed exists for what reason? 
Jesse. They, they exist to protect the lower and middle classes of the United States citizen. No, <laughs> they're in existence to protect banks. They, they, that's what they're there for. And they'll say, well, if banks don't function well, then that the consumers are finished. Uh, and so that's why we have to do what we have to do. But that's not their rationale. That is not their um, primary target audience. That's not their goal. Their goal is to be the bank for banks, the banker for banks. That's what they're there for. So they could return to, to ZERP and QE and maybe Hel maybe Janet Yellen and Powell will launch helicopter money part two. Uh, but the devastating effects of that for this nation's debt to GDP ratio, for the sovereign bond market, for the dollar, and you want to own commodities. You're going you're gonna to want to own commodities in a big way if that's the case. And do you look at it the same way across the spectrum of commodities, energy? Um, I'm wondering if you look at uranium at all, that this is a story that's obviously done very well up until this point, um, over the, the course of the last year, especially um, base metals. When, when looking out at the commodity spectrum, which ones do you think will perform the best in the scenario that you've outlined? Well, I think, uh, let me just say commodities are not a monolithic group. And, and I learned this, I, I put together um, a uh, Claymore, it was a Claymore back then, Guggenheim now bought them, uh, a, a, a fund that invested in commodities. And you learn you learn when you, when you make mistakes. I learned from my mistakes, hopefully, <laughs> most of them at least. And you, know, you just can't buy commodities. Buy commod well, like I said, commodities are not monolithic. There's base metals, there's energy, and then there's gold. And gold is money. And commodities, other than that, base metals, energy, you met, you know, I missed the whole uranium trade. Uranium has been a fantastic trade. I missed the entire trade. So, you know, uh, mea culpa on, on, on that one. But in the next cycle, I expect oil, uranium, and gold. Those are the three things. Uh, oh, and I, I would even venture into some of the soft commodities too, because in stagflation, they do fantastic. That's what the back test shows me. So uh, those are all things I'm interested in. But we are headed into first, I think, dis we've been in dis disinflation. We have a small cycle here of inflation. I think that I don't think that lasts long because I because we just talked about that liquidity cycle that we're headed into starting in March, April. That goes from disinflation then to deflation and recession. That's when you want to short commodities. Then coming out of that, as the Fed with reticence and reluctance goes back into reliquifying the banking system, that's when you want to go. That's the, the nucleus of my portfolio will be commodities. Well, I'd like to get your current thoughts on gold and silver. As you mentioned, gold is money, so it's a little bit different than a lot of the other commodities. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on the physical metals, both of them, how you see them currently positioned, what the catalysts will be for the price to potentially rise higher, and you mentioned that you're also invested in a handful of gold miners at the moment. Maybe you could also shed some light into how you evaluate uh, a gold mining stock to determine if it's a good investment. First of all, I have no silver. Um, I know it disappoints a lot of people, but uh, silver is a base metal and a precious metal. And unfortunately, it's you know, it's probably the most manipulated and most frustrating market I've I, I could I've been in this business 33 years, Jesse. I, I just I, I find silver extremely frustrating to even try to invest in. So I have none of it right now. Again, silver might be one of the major holdings in the next reliquification of the banking system cycle that we're going to go through uh, maybe late late in 24 and 25. Um uh, but right now, I hold about seven, eight percent of the portfolio in physical gold, and I'm very happy to be there. And the the catalyst for that is just you know we we have is this country's got such a situation of uh, tenuous asset bubbles that are that are breaking though though it's being masked by the mainstream financial media. They don't talk about it much, but commercial mortgage backed securities, commercial real estate properties are are in, in a devastating condition. Um, the in fact, if you look at the home price to income ratio, it's higher today than it was even at the peak of 2006 in the previous lead up to the global financial crisis and the collapse of the housing market. It was five back then. Now it's 
So it's we've never been in a worse situation. And home prices are are today uh, 50% more expensive to own a home, 50% more expensive than it is to rent. It's never been anywhere close to that. So um, so these this situation in this country is very tenuous. And that lends itself to like, what, what do I look for when I want to buy gold? I want to see falling nominal and real interest rates. And I think the next move here, the next move is disinflation and then deflation. And that's when gold just performs spectacularly. So that's 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 the next catalyst that I'm looking for. Again, with, and with any one, insight you can, with one caveat, yeah, I'm sorry, with one quick caveat there. In a in a in a deep liquidity crisis, everything gets sold, and that includes gold. So that's not anywhere near the situation we have right now. The first move is a, is a skyrocket. So when the Fed starts, so when the economic data deteriorates later this year. Gold is going to take off to the moon, in my opinion. The only thing you have to look at, which will be on my radar, is if we get into a repo crisis, when the, when the money markets get clogged, that that would be an occasion for me to sell sell some of my gold. But it wouldn't be something I would sell for a very long time because I I know what's going to happen on the other side of that. So, and any insight you could provide into how you evaluate gold mining stocks? Yeah, I have. So Jesse, like I said in the beginning of this program, I'm not a commodities expert and I'm not an expert in individual stocks. So, you know, you look at Newmont, Barrick, um, just, or just buy the GDX. I mean, you're probably better off just buying the GDXJ or GDX. Don't buy the GDXJ unless we're really in a really big, strong bull market for not only gold, but the miners, because GDXJ, which is the juniors, that that will that will shorten your lifespan if you don't have that. So, um, yeah, that's you know that's why I I I try not to be a stop clock here. And I'm not a stop clock. I look at many many factors all day every day. And um, it, it, you know, people who say, well, you know, just buy mine gold mining stocks. Well, yeah, that's a great idea. But there are times when you want to be out and short of them, and there are times you want to be you know heavily concentrated in them. And so getting the timing right is what I try to do. So according to your model, then at the moment, what are the best asset classes to own right now? How are you currently positioned and any light you could shed on just how your model actually works and, and how it helps you determine where you want to be? So right now we're about 68% in short-term treasuries. So that's, that, that's a very large holding for me, uh, obviously. Um, so I'm not in, I'm not in the, in the T bills any longer. I moved from the bills to the notes. I want to capture a little of that duration, uh, convexity that I will get in, in a recession. And when the economic, uh, data deteriorates and I, and I, I'm very confident that it will. And in that case, you know, T bills, you, you can only make the yield. They don't, they don't appreciate in price. Um, so, uh, I, I, I went for one to three year treasuries so i get so i don't want to go out too long on the yield curve because although you'll, i think you make some money there they, they have a lot of uh, supply and inflation concerns out there so the long end of the yield curve is is mostly concerned about supply and inflation and there's an over we you know with a trillion dollars in interest that we're paying on our debt there's a lot of supply <laughs> concerns out there jesse um two trillion dollar deficits in in peacetime in two trillion dollar annual deficits, in full employment, in 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 soft landing nirvana, you know, come on. So you know the deficits are going to go to six trillion dollars per annum in a recession. For they'll go from two to anywhere between five and six trillion dollars. That's a lot of supply to to absorb. So, uh, and then you have inflation concerns. So I'm much, I'm much shorter duration on the yield curve. Um, uh, what else do I own? I own um, defensive stocks, low volatility stocks, uh, physical gold. Uh, I have no, uh, I have a small short in high yield, but I'm not out and out directly short in the portfolio as of yet. I'm waiting for my model, we want some insights into my model. I look at financial conditions. I look at the highly stochastic components to let me know when I should short. Um, looking at uh, uh, 
weekly jobless claims, anything that daily, the weekly components have to erode. Uh, credit spreads are still quiescent. So those those things, the, the, the things in my model, there's 20 components, 10 for inflation, deflation, 10 for recession and growth. The model is built to tell me how to front run, front run the, the, the little kitties that run run Wall Street. I, I, you know, these people, they look at the, like, I'll give you a quick example. How I call them little kitties. It's, it's a pejorative term, but it, it, they look at the non-farm payroll report and they react to it. They look at the headline. We 353,000 net new jobs were created. Oh my God, we're a booming economy. And of course, you know, the mainstream financial media just fill, you know, feeds that uh, illusion. But when you look into the numbers, the, the, the job market is a disaster. It's 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 deteriorating. Uh, you look at the, I don't want to go into all the numbers right now, but if you look at the the, the household survey, losing losing jobs, uh, the work week shrank, the the um, employment to population uh, employment to population ratio fell, uh, labor force is declining. Uh, so it, it's a bad number, but it, what I'm trying to say is that I would front run, my model's built to front run what most investors and money managers on Wall Street will do. And they will follow me once I short the market and I will short the market when the arcane components deteriorate with the smart money is, and that's in the credit spreads and financial conditions. And I just want to get some clarification on defensive stocks because different people have different ideas of, of what that is. I was talking to David Hay and Louis Vincent Gov recently for them. Energy stocks are are defensive. So what do you consider to be defensive stocks? No, 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 no. Defense not. <laughs> so energy stocks are not defensive stocks. No. So when I said defense, I said aerospace and defense and low volatility stocks. Low volatility. Oh, aerospace and defense. Aerospace and Interesting. defense. And yeah. it's been a very, uh, very good uh, investment for us and low volatility stocks. Uh, so they give you a little bit of protection. Think like, you know, Walmart, um, waste management. These are the kind of right. that are in. Now they have low volatility uh, attributes. That's all. That's what you want to own when you're have when you're in a period of disinflation and going into it and, and going into deflation. Of course, that list gets narrower, more narrow. As you get further and further into deflation, uh, but that's what I mean. No energy stock. I mean, it, you go back to July of two thousand and eight and tell me how well you did in your energy stocks and how defensive they were and how much they protected you when the poop hit the fan uh, in the global financial crisis. They, they were not. They're not defensive. No, they're highly cyclical. I would avoid them. At, I would avoid them until we have a. a Listen, listen, I've been wrong about up until now. You know, like uranium has done very well. Um, but I got I'm completely out of energy stocks. I think that's been a pretty good trade. Um, but but you want to own them when the when the cycle is nascent and starting to increase, not at the end of one. You're sitting on a lot of short-term treasuries at the moment. Um, I think this is also probably a good time to be in short-term treasuries, money market accounts, et cetera stay on the sidelines accumulating cash. But the other side of that coin is, you know, the timing the market versus time in the market. Peter Lynch famously said that far more money has been lost by investors in preparing for corrections than has been lost in the corrections themselves. So how, how because obviously you have a, a model that you use, you've been in the business for a long time, you're a very sophisticated investor. For your average person out there, should they be trying to play that game sitting on short-term T-bills or should they just be dollar cost averaging? Obviously, the whole dollar cost averaging into an ind index fund that was enabled by extremely low interest rate environment, that might be over. Howard Marks has pointed out there's a sea change in that sense. Um, I'm wondering how your average investor can think about that. Uh, Peter Lynch is a great investor. and uh, at, at, one, at one time, he's correct. I mean, you know, maybe... You know, in the 50s and 60s, uh, that was a great idea. 80s, 90s, just just buy, just buy, buy and hold, dollar cost average. Um, but after you know 1971, when we broke the gold window, uh, we set ourselves up for a disaster. I mean, we the the, the debt to GDP ratio was 35%, not 125% in the 80s. 
125% today, 35% in the 80s. So we, you know, we have a different regime here. Uh, let's just look at other countries around the world. Now I'll go to the United States. So if you invested in China in 2007, the Shanghai index, you're, you're down 50% since 2007. If you invested in Japan in 1989, then you're, you're, you're down you know, 35 years later. You're still down, Jesse. You're down in nominal terms. Uh, if you invested in this country in 1929, it took, it took you to 1954 before you broke even. Uh, there were six years in um, post global financial crisis from 2008 to uh, when when, that, when when the the market regained its uh, high mark. So there are times, and this is a uh, there are times in this country when you could have just bought and hold stocks, and you'd be fine. But when you have bubbles to this extent, and we could only have these bubbles after we had a completely fiat currency. But if you bought in, in this country in the 29 bubble, uh, that's gotten worse because that, even back then, the debt to GDP, the, the total market cap, excuse me, the total market cap of equities as a percentage of GDP was 130%. Now it's 185% total market cap of equities to GDP. And we have bigger, but those huge bubbles are only possible under a fiat currency regime. That, and this is completely fiat currency regime that we have today. Uh, it, and look at China and Japan. Those bubbles, if, you, if you're investing in those bubbles and you have a buy and hold mentality, you could get destroyed. And, and I have a ton of any of my clients, you know, if you're a, a listener of my podcast or if you're a client of mine, you see every week on Wednesday, I come out with these data points and I prove over and over again, we are in a massive, unprecedented bubble in this country. Asset bubble and debt bubble. Because we've never had manipulation in, in 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 the cost of money like we've had. I mean, for 10 of the last 14 years, Jesse, interest rates were below 1%. That never happened. Leading up to the global financial, financial crisis, they were they were 1% for two years. <laughs> not, four, not 10, not a decade. So uh, um, the distortions are massive. Uh the mark, the, the environment has never been more dangerous. And if you want to buy and hold, because Peter Lynch, you know, I'm not saying he's one, but most of Wall Street, which is why I love to front run them, most of Wall Street are, are what I call used carpet salesmen. They, they're not, they're not market strategists. They're not economists. What they do is they take your money, and they closet index or try to mirror the S and P 500 and some with some bonds in there. You know, they may, I mean, I could do that too. I could buy SPY and TLT and, and say, see you later. Talk to me in a decade or so. Hope you don't call. You know, I don't want to hear from you. And you're, just, you're just a salesperson. So when the market does well, you're like a genius. And when, when the market craps out, then you, you don't take the phone calls. Or you say, you say something like this. Uh, it's time in the market, not timing the market. Which is a platitude that doesn't make any sense. Because if you can time the market, and you can, if you know what to look out for, that's what the model that I created is predicated on and built on and, and, and tries to do, then, you know, if, if my model is flashing red and I know we're, having, we're heading into a deflationary recession, why in God's name would I hold my same portfolio that I had in, in boom times? I mean, wouldn't I want to, like, you know, increase the bonds a little bit? Maybe sell some of these high-flying tech stocks. Maybe get out of some commodities that are cyclical. Then wouldn't, wouldn't that make sense, right? Well, that's what I do. That's what I try to do. That's what I will continue to do. Well, tell us about Pento Portfolio Strategies. Uh, what it is you do there, and where people can find it. It's pentaport.com uh, is the website. Um, and if you want to uh, get access to my podcast, it's called the Midweek Reality Check. I publish that every Wednesday night. It's a five-week free trial, and if you don't like it, the trial expires, and you don't have any more obligations. If you like it and you want to subscribe, it's fifty dollars a year. Okay, fifty dollars a year to get the real data and the real analysis. And if you have a hundred thousand dollars, and you're a U.S. citizen and you qualify for the portfolio, then I'll manage your money personally for you. Great. Well, I'll put a link in the description below for people who want to check that out. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. 
always love talking to you. And uh, I learned a ton as usual. Great to be on with you, Jesse. And thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this episode is sponsored by Spotlight Bullion. Create a free account using the link in the description below for your chance to win a roll of American Silver Eagles. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.